Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. So we're in week eight and we're talking about electrochemical sensors. And in this particular mini lecture, we're gonna be going through the glucose sensor as an example of biological analytes. We're also gonna be briefly touching on the concept of amphimetric sensors or sensors that work by the detection of current. So as I said, an amphimetric sensor, instead of measuring the electrochemical potential of a cell, measures the current that's generated at a working or sensing electrode. And in the case of an amphimetric sensor, a really key difference is the electrochemical potential is proportional, remember, to the log of the concentration of a species. In an amphimetric sensor, then you're going to be having a current proportional to just directly the concentration of species that's in a solution. And that's going to be a problem, potentially, if you want to work over large dynamic ranges, depending on how you're measuring current. But remember, it has a different relationship to the analyte concentration than the potentiometric sensors do. Okay, so glucose sensing is an example that can actually be either potentiometric or amphiometric, as you'll see. But the basic idea is that you want to measure glucose in somebody's blood. And I'm counting it as a biological analyte because it is of biological significance. It's a big molecule. It's a sugar. And what you see, see here uh, was taken from a good website, Wikipedia. Uh, and it shows actually the evolution of the glucose sensor over the last almost 20 years. So in this upper left, you can see you needed to put this big old piece of, you know, paper in with a lot of blood on it. And as a function of time, the amount of blood that a patient needs to provide to one of these sensors has fallen dramatically. In fact, it's down to less than 0.3 microliters of blood. So you do need blood to measure glucose, but you need a vanishingly small amount. And it's an incredibly important market. And advances in glucose sensing, particularly what's called continuous monitoring of glucose, are something that the medical establishment has really been pushing for. But of course, you have to couple that with people are not going to want to get stuck all the time and, and, and have their blood taken. So we'll talk about continuous glucose sensing at the end of the lecture. But let's just talk about how do you sense glucose. So early glucose sensors realized that if you're going to be measuring glucose in blood, you are right away going to be confronted with a specificity problem. You've got a ton of different types of sugars in blood. If you're really interested in glucose, you're going to need specificity. And one of the best places to get specificity is nature herself. So glucose oxidase is an enzyme that takes glucose and it converts it to gluconolactone. And it's very specific just for glucose. So if you have glucose oxidase around and you have glucose around, you're going to be forming this lactone. And in the process, you're also going to be forming hydrogen peroxide if oxygen is around. And so the early, early glucose sensors didn't try to measure glucose directly. What they did is they looked at how much H2O2 was present, and they reasoned that that would be from the activity of glucose oxidase, which they added to the samples. So H2O2 then was the thing that they detected. And sometimes they detected it colorimetrically, and sometimes they detected it electrically. As shown here, you can see the peroxides getting oxidized. But on the other hand, the challenge with measuring it is that it's going to be really pH sensitive, which of course, in different biological fluids, you can have different pHs. So the problem with using H2O2 as kind of an indirect measure of the glucose oxidase reaction is that it was actually very sensitive to pH and also not unique. It could arise from other kinds of chemical reactions that might be present in a biological sample. So to fix that, most glucose oxidase, glucose oxidase is still going and it's still turning glucose into, I guess, glu gluconolactone. Um, but instead of using oxygen, it's now relying on what's called a ferrocyanide ferrocyanide couple which is nothing more than a big iron organometallic complex in which the iron is shuttling between oxidation states. And the ratio of ferrocyanide to ferrocyanide can actually be measured using an electrode very much like kind of a Nernst sort of process. And so what you see here is that the, this glucose to gluconic acid piece is now coupled to the ferrocyanide couple. And this is actually called a mediator. And a mediator is a substance that allows you to measure the sort of what's going on in one reaction and translate that into an electrical signal. So shown here is actually an amphiometric measurement in which the concentration of glucose was related to the amount of current that was generated in this ferroferrocyanide couple measured amphiometrically. 
Um, and so the mediator is really important. It got rid of the hydrogen peroxide, which could have been generated in a lot of ways. And you can only get the fair it converting to the ferrocyanide if you actually have this reaction occurring. So it's somewhat specific to the glucose reaction. So a typical commercial glucose sensor these days has a lot of enzyme in it and has a lot of this potassium ferrocyanide, which can convert to ferrocyanide and back again. And then it has other non-reactive ingredients. And so that's one example of how things evolved. But notice again the importance of that very specific enzyme, glucose oxidase, in the specificity of this electrochemical detection. And also the addition of a mediator, which is a specific redox couple. And by couple, I mean both a reducing and an oxidizing partner. And that couple is going to be going back and forth and will act as an indicator for the change and the progress of the glucose reaction. So a modern glucose monitor then looks like something you see here. Uh, it's going to be a pad. Again, forget the big beaker with liquid. It's going to be all condensed down into kind of a, uh, not quite a microelectrode, um, but close. Uh, and in this case, you can see that there are three electrical contacts. One contact goes to a cell that has both glucose oxidase and the mediator, the ferroferrocyanide couple. The other indicator has, no, has the mediator but no enzyme. And then you have this mesh over everything that you hope will keep out some of the really large things like really, you know, cells and other things that could really gum up your electrode. And so that's one way to put a barrier that hopefully will prevent biological fouling of this electrode surface. And you'll also know right down the middle is a reference electrode because you always need some sort of reference electrode if you're measuring, in this case, what's going to be a potential. And you put your blood sample right here in order to measure it. So if you look at this, you might think through, one of the challenges is that vitamin C as sedimentifying and other agents can actually participate and have enough oomph to react with a ferroferrocyanide couple. And so they could potentially be interfering agents because they would create a change in the concentration of the ferro to the ferrocyanide that has nothing to do with the glucose oxidase process. So I want you to stare at this whole scheme and figure out why they built it the way they did and how they're going to deal with that interference problem. Well, they're going to deal with it because they built an extra electrode. So down here at the bottom is indicator 2 electrode which has a mediator, it has a ferro for a cyanide couple, but doesn't have glucose oxidase. So if you get a signal from that second electrode, that's an interfering agent. And you can subtract it away from the total signal from the top electrode. And so that's a clever way to deal with interfering agents because the glucose oxidase is really only, only, only going to react with glucose. So the interferences from the vitamins and the other substances are just with the ferroferrocyanide mediator. And you can correct for that in the way shown here. So again, like any electrochemical sensor, uh, it's interesting to me these have a number of issues with both their accuracy and their reliability. I was surprised at these numbers being as large as they were. But they're still FDA approved and very useful for people who have to monitor their blood glucose levels. But What's nice is that there's been a development in um, subcutaneous monitoring of glucose. So as these sensors have gotten better and better, and they're building in these reference electrodes and these ways of correcting for interfering agent, interference agents in blood, what they're able to do is actually keep a monitor continu continuously monitoring blood glucose, which is enormously valuable to many patients. And so what you see here is a study. Again, this is a PLOS one, so you can go and read all about it if you want. Um, in which they looked at serum glucose concentrations measured by central lab detection. In this case, a very routine and rigorous, I believe, believe it was actually a GC methodology, perhaps. Um, and they measured the glucose concentration very, very accurately and precisely, but only one time. And then up here, you can see the glucose value by this continuous glucose monitoring system, which is these sub-Q implants that then work off of the sensors similar to what we've been talking about. And of course, if they were perfect, there would be a perfectly straight line of one here. And you'll notice that for low concentrations, they do pretty well. They're actually pretty perfect um, in the sense that they don't agree 100%. But what this graph explains is that, in general, as long as they're not in the C and the D region, you won't make a bad medical decision based on the inaccuracies that are present in these continuous monitoring devices that are electrochemically based. 
So this is an example of, okay, maybe they're not so accurate and precise, but from the point of view of do you make an intervention and, for example, try to change your blood glucose chemistry, what this tells you is that, okay, they have some issues in their error, but not so much that it's going to cause patients to make wrong decisions with some level of confidence. And this paper has a very good discussion of that. I hope through the discussion of the glucose sensors, you can understand that when you're measuring biological or larger analytes, specificity is critical. And that's usually derived in biological sensing through the use of an enzyme, which has got a substrate, which is the thing you're interested in. Or as you'll see, if we had time to do biosensors, an antibody, which is very specific for an antigen of interest that increases the expense of biological sensors because both enzymes and antibodies are not easy to come by. They cost a lot more than your average sort of carbon electrode, um, but they can be incredibly useful if the information is, for example, medically relevant. The other thing I hope that you saw is that you can really do some, through the design of the system, build in references and calibrations in effect that greatly improve the accuracy of your measurements. Thanks so much. See you next time.